everyone and welcome into the Twilight Zone. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Welcome into a pond for the review of B. Marsh and Michael presented by Underdog Fantasy. Brandon, it just feels like we are living in the Twilight Zone. You know, I have been off for the last four weeks. I missed three Broncos games. And I told my wife as I was moving, as I was heading into the station today, I said it feels like we're doing the exact same show that we were doing before I even left to go on paternity leave. It seems like it's the same show almost every week. Pretty it's much the every same week. game it's every week. That's why. It's the same game. <laughs> the same game. We're I mean, watching it over and over again. It's really unbelievable what we saw yesterday. Um, the fact that we continue to see it over and over and over again. The defense plays well until late in the game. The offense is inept. The Broncos end up losing 10-9 to and fall to 3-9 and on the season, securing another losing season. Brandon, you were on that team in 2015 that won the Super Bowl. You had a winning season in 2016, and then it's been losing season 17, losing in 18, losing in 19, losing in 20, losing in 21, and now six straight losing seasons for this once proud franchise. Let's jump into the game. <laughs> show, starting with what's on Marshall's mind. What's on Marshall's mind brought to you by Breckenridge Distillery, the official bourbon of the Denver Broncos. Shop Colorado retailers for their limited edition Broncos bourbon blend. B. Marsh, what you got? All right, well, look, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate. You know what I'm saying? I think the Broncos are close. You know, I think they are close. You know, they, they lose a lot of these games by touchdown, you know, a field goal, you know, maybe 10 points. But at the same time, look, the defense is stellar. The defense are playing out of their minds, right? The offense, they're just an offensive coordinator away. <laughs> they're just an OC away, maybe a couple of O-linemen. I think they're close. I mean, it's not going to materialize this year, right. but I think next year it can materialize. I think they can make the full 180 turn and be a great team next year. Brandon, what remind me, what position did you play? <laughs> I play linebacker. Yeah, you're such a defensive guy sitting here yeah. like, oh, man, the defense is playing so great, blah, blah, yeah. blah. But, Brandon, it's the same thing that we've been saying, and you're talking about how they're an offensive coordinator. Away. They're on their second play caller this year, right? So they've already changed play callers, and yet we still – see their inability to pick up third downs. They were two for 12 yesterday on third down. The CBS broadcast had a great graphic that they aired with a minute to go in the first quarter after the Broncos had a three and out. It was their 39th three and out this season. They ended with 43 and outs because they had another one later in the game. That leads the NFL. It's almost incomprehensible at this point. So, so Brandon, they're close. So what needs to change? And I hear you say that it's offensive coordinator. Is it, is it a scheme issue at this point? And, and is that why this Broncos offense can't do anything on a week-in and week-out basis? I think absolutely it's a scheme issue. I think when I say, you know, what they're on the second play caller, but at the same time it's still the same playbook. And I think Nathaniel Hackett still has some influence on Clint calling the plays, right? So I think they need a fresh new playbook, a new – uh, you know, new faces on the offensive side of the ball as far as coaches goes. You know, at the end of the day, I think that's what it is because it's still Nathaniel Hackett's offense. It's still his influence on the play calling. You know, I mean, the offense is, is inept. It can't be that bad. You know, when you look at it, right, you know, on paper, you know, Russell Wilson, I mean, even Latavius Murray is, is a, a pretty good back. You know, you got Cortland Judy. You know, look, it, there's no way it can be this bad. That's why I'm going to say, go. I'm going to go ahead and say it's a scheme issue. And I think they need to go ahead and just replace the whole offensive staff. Um, they got to do that. They have to do it next year. I mean, if they don't do it, we're going to have the same result next year and that we're looking at this year, and we just gave away draft picks and $250 million. Now, and we can't do that. And that's what's so disappointing, Brandon, is that it felt like they had done that, right? And, and you go back to Vance Joseph, who was a defensive head coach. You go back to Vic Fangio, who was a defensive head coach. And it felt like when they finally got an offensive guy, Nathaniel Hackett, in, okay, all of a sudden the offense was going to change. And I think that why it has been so disappointing is because there has been no change in the offense. In fact, the offense has gotten worse than what it was last year with Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater. I mean, the offense has taken a step back with an addition of an offensive-minded head coach and a guy who is arguably a Hall of Fame quarterback. It's got to with more talent, yes. right? Think about that. So that's how, that's how you know I'm thinking it's scheme. You know what I'm saying? It's, it may be culture, right? Um, and, and obviously, like you said, bringing the offensive-minded head coach, bringing somebody who was with the Green Bay Packers and they scored a lot of points and won a lot of games, you would think, okay, this is – it's, it's going to turn our franchise around, but it hasn't. So 
getting worse with better players, I think that's a sign of maybe it's coaching. You know what's crazy, too, is you look at Russell Wilson's numbers from yesterday. 17 to 22, 189 yards, okay? Not great numbers in terms of yardage, but 17 of 22 is really productive from a passing standpoint. They were averaging 11 yards per reception. That's actually really good. But their inability to keep drives alive and to pick up anything on third downs, they didn't even get inside the red zone yesterday. I mean, so many times we've talked about how, they, yeah, right, exactly. Thank you. That was a great expression. So many times we've talked about the red zone issues. We can't even talk about red zone issues because they didn't even get inside the 20 yard line yesterday. I think that's, I'm flabbergasted, right? That's because awful. to not be able to get into the red zone right now, we know the Ravens have a historic, a historically good defense year in and year out. But at the same time, you know, this is still football, right? We have a good offense, really good players. And to not be able to, to, to utilize our, our, you know, our red zone offense in a, in a whole football game is, is nuts, right? Shout out to BMAC. Unfortunately, he didn't make the last, the last kick, but the whole season's on his shoulders, essentially. Every game's on his shoulders, you know? Yeah. Every game he has to know he has to be spot on or we're going to get blown out the water. Well, not only does he have to be spot on, Brandon, he has to be historic. He's got it. You know, I mean, and this, this, I mean, I'm serious. This started yeah. with game one in Seattle when you're yeah. kicking a 64 yard field goal to try and win. Yesterday it was 63. You're asking him to do stuff. Brandon McManus is a really good kicker. There's no doubt about that. You're asking him to do stuff that has never been done before in the history of football in terms think, of the amount of these uh, of these really really long kicks. I think you're asking him to be Justin Tucker. And unfortunately, I love B Mac, right? Great kicker, one of the best probably in Broncos history, but he's not Justin Tucker. Justin Tucker is a generational kicker. He's the guy that you, you know, that the Ravens have relied on. Yes. Right. There's only one, that. right? There's only one Justin Tucker. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Um, so, so, Brandon, let me ask you this too, because Justin Simmons stands there on the podium and, and God love him. Justin's always going to say the right things. But he's like, we just have to be better. We have to, we have to come up with one more stop. And we didn't do that. And I'm looking and I'm like, you had, you had two, two interceptions yesterday, Justin, right? Like the offense turned that, hang on, I want to get this right because I saw this and I was like, did they really do that? They get, Broncos get an interception. Justin gets the interception. Broncos get eight yards on that next drive. They end up settling for a field goal. Very next drive, Justin gets another interception. The offense goes five plays, 11 yards, and ends up having to punt the ball away. Right. And yet Justin Simmons is left standing at the podium saying we have to be better. Giving up 10 points wins you every other game in the NFL every. this week. And if, if, if you go back, probably it wins you every single game or at least the majority, 90 percent of them throughout the course of the season. If you only allow your opponent to score 10 points, I, I just can't get on board with what Justin is saying. And I know he's got to say all the right things, but I, I just there's so much more to it than the defense only being allowed one bad drive per game. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot more to it, man. And look, we all know what they're thinking. We all know what Justice thinking. We all know what the whole defense is thinking. They just can't say it because they got to show some unity because we're a team. But we know what it is, man. We know when he says we got to be better, of course he's going to put the onus on, on the defense because he's a leader and that's what leaders do. But look, I mean – it's, it's like we're beating a dead horse. We know yeah. we know what yeah. the issue is, and it's crazy because we don't, you know, the, what the eleven games in, twelve games in, they don't know how to fix it. They can't fix it. Yes, it's they. It's the whole playbook and the whole office has to be removed. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only that's the only answer. I don't see anything else. To be honest with you, I don't see. You know, I mean, you could bring in a bunch of players and 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 help that out, which maybe can help. But I think the scheme. I think they got to go. Well, I, I totally agree because you brought in a bunch of players. You know what I mean? Right. You brought in the key player in Russell Wilson, and it has not worked. Now with two different play callers, and that tells me you're, you're exactly right. It's a scheme issue. It's not a player issue. Now it's a scheme issue, and you got to do something uh, in order to, to change that. So what do the Broncos do? When we come back, we will look ahead to the future. Crazy to think there's still five games left in this season, but it's already time to peer into our crystal ball. What do the Broncos need to do this offseason to make sure that they don't head for a seventh straight losing season in 2023? We will discuss that and how to hand out some grades from tomorrow, including 
a couple high grades. We did see some good performances in A as well. All that and more coming up next right here on Upon Further Review of Marsh and Michael presented by Underdog Fans. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. It's also the fastest growing fantasy app in the industry. Visit underdogfantasy.com or find them in the App Store. Welcome back inside upon further review of the Martian Michael presented by Underdog Fantasy. Brandon, it's crazy, but we were sitting here and Broncos are 12 games in. This season's basically a wrap. They haven't officially been eliminated from the playoffs, but there are only two teams in the NFL that have worse records than the Broncos right now. The Texans sitting at 1 and 10, the Bears are at 3 and 10, and then the Rams are also at 3 and 9. You have to know that the NFL schedule makers are like, "Really?" We put Rams Broncos on Christmas Day in the middle of the day, like going to be a beautiful matchup. Matt Stafford, Russell Wilson, the defending Super Bowl champs, Broncos are going to be competing for the AFC West. And that thing is just absolutely blown up in their face. I wonder if it's going to get flexed out. It can't. You know it can't. They can't. Oh. No, because it's Christmas Day and because yeah. of the way the schedule works, you can't flex that out. They already flexed Broncos Chiefs. It's going right? to be a terrible game. <laughs> it's gonna be the same game. Yeah, no, it's you know what I'm saying. Be, yes, yeah. I don't know what the under is. It could be 35. I'm still gonna take it. I absolutely take the question. Under. So, so, so the the Broncos did they give up the 2023 draft pick or is it the start of 2024 first round? Uh, the then they gave up last year and this year. So they uh, they they gave up their first round pick, but then they got a first round pick back with the Bradley Chubb trade. Okay, so they'll be able to get one. So they do have a first-round pick uh, heading into to this year's draft, which is what we're going to talk about now because there's five games left, <laughs> but we know those five games really don't matter. Um, yeah. Broncos fans <laughs> should be rooting for the Dolphins to lose so that they get a better pick because the Seahawks are rooting for the Broncos to lose because the Seahawks get the Broncos' first-round pick. But, Brandon, there is a long list of things that George Payton, if he's still the general manager – uh, needs to accomplish this offseason. What is priority number one, in your opinion, outside of the coaching staff, just from a roster perspective, the area where the Broncos need to improve the most heading into 2023? I think priority number one is is offensive line. You know, I think they have to shore up that O-line. They have to get uh, blue chip prospects, guys, right, guys that could really hold up, really protect and, and really grind it on the run game. You know, I, I think that's where they got to start. Now, I'm not saying the O-line is terrible right now, but it's not elite. And and you see the, the teams that last and that go the farthest, they have elite offensive lines, and that's what we need to get back to. We need to get an elite offensive line and sure up those guards and and uh, that right tackle position, man. I, that's That will be all right for us. You know, the offensive line was an issue of concern for me heading into this season. You factor in that Mike Munchak is no longer here coaching that offensive line. I think that is a huge, huge issue for them. Um, and and then obviously they've had some injuries and guys have had to be put into positions where they're not necessarily comfortable and not, not playing their best. But the offensive line, to me, has been probably the number one issue with this football team that has been overlooked because – Russell's been so bad because the coaching has been so bad. I think that Russell's been so bad in part because the offensive line has been so bad. And if you remember, this is part of what drove him out of Seattle, was that the Seahawks, he felt like, didn't do enough to help protect him, and he felt like he was getting hit too much. I have to imagine he's feeling the exact same way after one year here in Denver. Maybe he's feeling worse, <laughs> you know, because yeah. uh, Geno Smith looked like he's, you know, has a clean pocket some of the time. <laughs> You know what I mean? So he's got to be feeling worse because he can't score. He's getting hit. Three and outs are crazy. Look, I, I think they have to shove the offensive line, and they got to do it fast. Yeah, and there's a lot of positions there um, that they need to shore up. And so I think it's it's not just one, right? And Dalton Reisner is a free agent, and they have yet to talk to him about a contract. And so so what does that mean? And I don't know that Dalton has necessarily played great, but he's at least been consistent, right? And I go back to Garrett Bowles when Garrett Bowles was having all the issues with the holds, and John Elway said, hey, you know what, but at least he's available, right? And that's, <laughs> that's part of it. And so yeah. um, I, I think that they need to make some serious moves there. I think they need to draft 
high in the draft, and then I think they need to go out and, and sign somebody in free agency um, who can come in and, and kind of shore things up on that offensive line. Another position, Brandon, that I look at where they need to figure out what they're going to do is at running back. And, yeah. and what do they do with Latavius Murray? And can they get a guy who can take some carries from Javante Williams early in the year? Because that was a devastating knee injury that Javante suffered. He is not going to be back to speed, in my opinion, week one of next season. So you need a guy who can take carries early and then kind of compliment him later on down the year, in, in my opinion. Look, it's only one guy that tore his ACL and then came back the next year and looked better than he did uh, before he tore it. That's Adrian Peterson, right? Well, he came back. Adrian Peterson did a disservice to every player who has ever torn his ACL. Like, <laughs> seriously. I mean, what he did was unbelievable. And then people thought it would become the standard. And, and it's, it's unfathomable. It's unattainable. Right. And so, like, he is now the gold standard. And everybody else is always like, oh, well, Adrian Peterson did it. He ruined things for running backs for the rest of their careers. Ruined it because, it's like you said, it's not attainable. And I'm not sure what Adrian Peterson did in that rehab or how he attacked it or whatever went on. But I don't know is he came back better. And I'm shocked right now. I don't expect that from Javante Williams. We can't expect that from Javante. So we got to have another bell cow back. It was him and Melvin that traded carries. Melvin is no longer there. I don't think you keep Latavius. I think, you know, you let the, the vet go. Uh, you know, he's done well for what he, you know, for what he was asked to do this season, but you let him go, you get a young running back, maybe third, fourth round pick, somebody that you know who can tote the rock, uh, catch, catch balls off the backfield, take cares off Javante, you know, somebody who was also, you know, pretty good. I mean, if you look at the Bears, they have a good, I think they have a good uh, system, you know what I'm saying? You got David Montgomery and Herbert, you know, Herbert came out of nowhere, right? You got Zeke and, and uh, Tony Pollard, you got a lot of these teams that, have a two running back system and, and they found success. And cause you know, running back, that's the position. I think it, the turnover is the highest in the league yeah. and uh, it's the shortest span lifespan in the league. You know, those guys get banged up. Those guys get replaced. It is what it is. So you can help Javante's career by adding another running back. Well, and, and to the Tony Pollard thing is a really good point because not only does that help Zeke, but that starts with Dallas's offensive line in my Come opinion. On. Right? And so Come on. you get the good offensive line and all of a sudden your running backs look a lot better. And yes. <laughs> you know, I'm of the mindset that you draft a running back in that second, third, fourth round area every mm -hmm. year, maybe every two years. And you focus really on the, the high draft capital and the high money on your offensive line because they can make those guys behind them look better. Yeah, I, I, look, 100 percent, you know, and, and that's what it's about. Like you said, you could you have a stellar offensive line. Yeah. You know, we won't know if Tony Pollard's the average or not until he goes to another team. Exactly. And how many <laughs> times have we seen that, right? A, a, lot. a running back who has a really good year behind a really good offensive line and then goes somewhere else, gets paid. I'm, I'm in favor of never paying running backs. Um, <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden his numbers decrease because his offensive line wasn't as good. So, um, okay, so offensive line, running back. What about defensively, Brandon? I mean, do – they're probably going to fire the coaching staff, right? Which means yeah. that this defensive staff is probably going to be gone because whoever they get to replace Nathaniel Hackett is going to bring in his own staff. And and I, I see the face that you just made. You don't you don't think that's a good idea? I don't think it's a good idea. I think if you if you look at the tape and you look at the numbers, you got to keep the same defense, right? You got to keep the same staff. Now I get what you're saying because you know most coaches come in they want to bring their guys. Yeah my own guys we're going to change the culture we're going to bring but sometimes you know a coach comes in and, and and hopefully Peyton could have you know uh the wherewithal or or the balls to say look I'm going to hire you but the defensive staff is staying now obviously the coach can decide to take it or not but at the same time you know the defense is not the issue it's not the issue but well, I can see that happening so what I hear you saying is go hire an offensive coach right Blow out the offense because obviously their scheme and, and did not work. Go get maybe a veteran offensive coach who would be willing to put his pride aside and put his guys, you know, who he's come up with or whatever. Like, you know how incestuous that coaching circle is in the NFL and can say, hey, you know what? Okay, this defensive staff, Azero Evero, they're doing a great job. They basically kept Vic, some of Vic Fangio's defense, tweaked it a little bit, added some different concepts, and, and have had a really good year. Uh, they're third in terms of yards. They're second in terms of points per game. Let's keep them and just change things offensively. 
That's how well, I see maybe it. That's what they'll do, but I think that's what they should do. That's how I see it. But like you said, I don't know if that's what that's what they will do because, like you said, a lot of times coaches come in. Now I'm gonna bring my own staff, my own culture. I'm gonna change the whole culture. That's what they say, right? I'm gonna change the whole culture around here. So why I keep the same defensive staff? Uh, but I hope the DC, if he does leave, he deserves a DC. He he needs to go from DC to DC, not DC back down to DP coach or passing game coordinator. No, no, no. He deserves a, another defensive coordinator job. I think he deserves a, a look at a head coaching job. Yeah, right. I really do. <laughs> I really do, because not only have they been outstanding on that side of the ball, but he's had to keep those guys together when the rest of the team is crumbling around them. You know, I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, and obviously they've got some good leaders in that room, but I think that Ajiro Evero absolutely deserves at least another D.C. job, if not uh, certainly a couple looks. He's going to get interviews for a head coach. I have, I have no doubt about that. Um, and so, so we'll see what happens there. Brandon, is there is there a possibility? I, I I'm almost asking this rhetorically. Is there a possibility you blow out Nathaniel Hackett and promote a zero Evero? Uh, I I think that could I think you know to be honest that could be a Would possibility. Would that be smart? Would that be smart in your mind? Because I I think that's only that's if, unlike anything that we've ever seen before. But would it be smart for them to do that? Only if he could take one another one of Sean McVay's protégés, right? Okay. What happened okay. with the Vikings yep. is is unbelievable. Okay? It was a Kevin O'Connell. He came from yeah. the Rams, went to the Vikings. Now the Vikings are 9-2. Uh, and two? What are they? T- yeah, second, second in the NFC right now behind the Eagles. Man, I <laughs> – now they look fantastic with him, right? So I'm not sure if they have another mind like Kevin. Um, you know uh, – I think if, if 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 that could happen, if they can get somebody from from uh, Los Angeles, that'd be dope. Yeah. You know, or, or or go get somebody from uh, from San Francisco. You yes, I mean? yes, like, exactly. Because a that's a similar type deal to where you could still be successful offensively. Hey, I love that because I'm a huge fan of the 49ers offense. Mm-hmm. Huge fan, right? Um, you know, Jimmy G can can be if if he is pedestrian. You know, the offense hides them, man. The, the, the West Coast offense and the motions and all that stuff, yes. they do a fantastic job. I'm a, you know, I, I was telling somebody uh, the other day, if I was to, you know, run an offense, if I was to be a head coach, offense, it'll be the 49ers. I would 100% do that. So I love that. Well, and it's the Shanahan offense. You know what I mean? And it was good enough to win them some Super Bowls back in the day. So let's, mm-hmm. let's try and run it back, baby. You know, yeah. I mean, tried to do that this year to a degree. Yeah. And, uh, and obviously it didn't work. All right, obviously more of that conversation to come uh, as, as the weeks go on here. we still got five more games to talk about. Before we end this segment, though, let's jump into our report cards. Today's report card brought to you by Colorado Lottery. Play CBS 4, pick the score for your chance to win $1,000 in scratch tickets. Enter at cbscolorado.com slash contest. Professor Marshall, who are we giving grades out to today? Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a linebacker myself, so I got to go with my two inside linebackers, uh, Alex Singleton, Josie Jewell. Both had 17 tackles. Oh, man. I, look, those numbers, the production is crazy for those two guys. I give them a B. Only reason I didn't give them an A is because they lost the game. Nah. But I give them a B for that. Uh, the easy grade would have been Justin Simmons. Two picks. He, he played well. You know, honorable, honorable mention. But both those linebackers, I always tell, you know, my guys in high school, you guys are on a string. You guys are yin and yang. You know what I'm saying? So, they look like they're really in sync, and, and I love to watch it. The easy grade, Justin Simmons. I literally have written down Justin Simmons in A. So uh, <laughs> instead of giving the easy grade, I'll go Greg Dulcich. I'm going to give him a B. Um, six receptions on eight targets, 85 yards. He and Russell Wilson clearly have a great connection right now, uh, which is impressive considering how much time Dulcich missed earlier in the year. Um, I think that what he has done coming in off of IR and the impact that he has had on this offense has been really, really impressive. Brandon, going back to the inside linebacker conversation, what was your what was your career high for tackles in a game? It was 15. 15? 15. 15. So they got me. Wow. Yeah, they got me. 15 or 14, one of them two. I think it was 15. I'm not going to lie. I thought it would have been higher. Yeah. Hey, it's tough <laughs> out here. <laughs> we had a lot but of guys making tackles. <laughs> look, look. Let me let me help you out here. You were playing on a winning team, so they weren't running the ball a lot late in the games, so you'd have the opportunity for those tackles to explode. There we go. I like that. Got <clears> great you. explanation. Got you. Hey, one more courtesy grade. Shout out to CU Athletic Director Rick George. He's getting an A for his hiring of Deion Sanders. I don't know how this thing is going to work out in Boulder, but I do know this. The amount of hype 
and energy and optimism that surrounds that program right now is unlike anything we have seen, certainly in the last several years. Really, I think you can go all the way back to like the 1990s. I mean, Brandon, that was the first thing we talked about when you hopped on the Zoom call today was you asked me, hey man, what is the, what is the culture like in Boulder right now? Everybody's buzzing. It's rare that we're sitting here in December and CU football has more buzz than the Denver Broncos do, but that's the case. <laughs> Hey, I, I don't know. This might be the first time, right? I mean, yeah. but prime time brings a lot of you know, he, he, he's he's brings the star power right to the program and to that area. So a lot of the kids are already planning on transfer. I'm telling you, man, I, he's gonna he, the way he recruits is amazing. For him to be able to get top recruits to come to a HBCU is unprecedented. And now it's it's even easier to get him to go to a Pac-12 school, man, Power Five school. So look, everybody wants to play for prime. He's a Hall of Famer. Right, he has that charisma. He he has that swagger. Everybody wants to to be around him. So I think he'll do well. Shout out to Rick George on the hire and A for me here as we wrap up our report card segment. All right, when we come back, we will zoom around the league, tell you what stood out to us from the rest of the NFL yesterday. And oh, by the way, the Broncos they're sitting at three and nine. They guess they'll play the Chiefs twice. The Chiefs who are coming off a loss from last Sunday. So this is going to be an interesting, interesting week here in Broncos country. We'll zoom around the league, plus uh, get you updated on some fantasy football stats and numbers. Shout out to Romy Bean for holding it down while I was gone. That and more next coming up right here on Upon Further Review of Marsh and Michael, presented by Underdog Fantasy. Travel consideration is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. It's also the fastest growing app in the industry. Visit underdogfantasy.com or find them in the app store. Welcome back to Inside Upon Further Review of P. Marsh and Michael presented by Underdog Fantasy. It is time for us to zoom around the league, tell you what caught our eye around the National Football League this week. Zoom Around the League is brought to you by ZoomCare. Visit ZoomCare.com to learn more about their beyond better urgent and primary health care clinics in Denver and in Boulder. B-Marsh, what stood out to me was, are the Bengals the class of the AFC? It's pretty crazy. They just have Kansas City's number right now. And so it got me thinking, if you're a team in the AFC, which team would you want to see the least in the AFC playoffs? Winner take all. You got the Chiefs, the Bengals, or the Bills. Which team do you not want to see? You don't want to see the Chiefs. It is what it is, really? man. Look, Patrick Mahomes, all right, late in games, the whole game is is out of this world. He's all world. You know, you saw what he did to the Bills last week, uh, last year in the playoffs. You give this guy 45 seconds, he'll get the ball down the field and, mm-hmm. and either score a touchdown or get a field goal, man. So, at the end of the day, the Bengals are great, right? The Bills are tough. But the Chiefs, you know, the way they play offense is out of this world, man. So you never want to see the Chiefs in the playoffs. All right. All right. Of course, the Broncos get to see the Chiefs uh, this week. The Chiefs, yeah. oh, by the way, who are coming off a loss to Cincinnati. Broncos still searching for their first win over Kansas City since the 2015 season. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. This game. Yep, that's right. That's exactly right. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy to think that that's where we are. And it felt like, Brandon, going into the year, this was going to be the year. The Broncos are absolutely going to get the Chiefs. They're going to get them at home, and they got to go to Kansas City uh, on New Year's Day. Oh, man, I don't I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm yeah, gonna... I'm, I'm interested to see uh, how the how uh, Evero is going to play uh, Patrick Mahomes in that, yeah. in that offense. I'm, I'm yeah. very curious. Can't wait. Me too. Me too. Uh, what else stood out to you uh, yesterday in the NFL? Man, and then I don't know if I've really said this ever, but shout out to the Detroit Lions, the Detroit Lions, okay? First of all, ever since they fired their passing game coordinator, they have won four out of their last five games, all right? The defense is playing really good. The offense has been stellar all season. You know, look, you can't fire Dan Campbell. You know, no. they might have another losing season, but they're trending upwards. They have more talent. You know, I mean, Jared Goff is is, is doing, you know, he's doing his job. Uh, so, look, shout out to the Detroit Lions, man. They, they, they look tough, and I think they are tough. Isn't it crazy, too? Like, doesn't it feel like everybody's just rooting for the Lions? Like, they've been so bad and such a beleaguered franchise that it's like, yeah, 
cool, we can root for the Lions. Like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, as long as they're not playing your team on Sunday. Like, it's cool to see Detroit do that and have the type of success that they're having. I'm with you. I absolutely love Dan Campbell and what he has done. Um, that dude is on another level, and, and it's cool to see him have that type of success. So, uh, so I'm with you. I hope that continues. I hope that continues. For sure. For sure. All right, let's yeah. jump in. What, what were we going to say? No, I was going to say he's still old school with the up. I can't get with it. But, hey, you know, it, if it works for them, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that that's the one part where I'd be like, no. But that's just because he has so much coffee. You seen his coffee order from Starbucks? It's no. Like, it's like a venti coffee, and then he gets, like, three shots of espresso and then, like, something else in there. Like, it's it's wild. It would kill a normal going straight to the bathroom. Being. Yeah. No, it would kill a normal human being uh, <laughs> if, uh, if somebody else were to drink that. All right, let's jump into uh, to fantasy football here. Before we do that, though, shout out to Romy Bean for holding things down on fantasy. You guys, uh, I'm not going to lie, you were coming up on me in the standings, and then Romy came in, filled in for me while I was out on paternity leave, and uh, and went 2-0. Yeah. Uh, look, all I know is I'm thinking that, okay, cool, you know, the head coach is down, he's sick, you know <laughs> right. what I'm saying, the GM doesn't know. I'm going to go ahead and sneak two wins in them real quick, and it didn't happen. Uh, man, shout out to Romy. I, I, look. I'm I'm very shocked. I'm very, you know, disappointed in my guys. But we got to do something, okay? We gotta we gotta go five and zero these last five games. All right, all right. We'll see what happens. The gauntlet has been laid down. Uh, let's jump into uh, to tonight's matchup. We're doing another mixed match in a Monday night football, Thursday night football melee. This, of course, brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. It's also the fastest growing fantasy app in the industry. So two games, Saints at Bucks on Monday night and then Raiders at Rams on Thursday night football. B-Marsh, since you've lost two in a row, you get the number one pick. <laughs> Who are you going with this week? Uh, give me Josh Jacobs, man. He's doing everything for that team. Dude, he has been unbelievable right now. Unbelievable. I, I, it started against the Broncos, right? Like back in October in Vegas when he ran off for 144 <laughs> or whatever it was. Um, yeah. yeah, he's playing absolutely great football right now. Love that pick. Uh, I'm going to stay with the Raiders. I'm going to go with Devontae Adams, and then uh, I'm going to go with Saints running back Alvin Kamara uh, as my my two picks there. I like I like both of those guys. Uh, yeah, I mean, you get those two going to make it tough for me to win. Yes. Um, so, you know, I picked Mike Evans next, right? I got Mike Evans, and then I only picked Chris Godwin. Typically, I would pick two receivers on the same team. That uh-huh. doesn't really make sense. But I picked Chris Godwin just so Mike <laughs> couldn't couldn't grab him up. So. Right, yeah, you that was a defensive pick. You're picking him so that I can't <laughs> <Yes>. take it. Hundred <laughs> percent. I gotta well, do something. Bottom line: if Tom Brady has a good day, then all yeah. of a sudden I'm toast because you've got his his top two receivers. He um, hasn't. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go with Chris Olave um, and then Taysom Hill. Wow, I'm just realizing I'm going Saints heavy. <laughs> yeah, so Chris Olave and Taysom Hill, uh, my two picks to uh, to round this out. You know, I mean, and, and now that I think about it, you know, picking Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, Brady never plays good against the Saints. Uh, this could this this could be ugly. I should have went Raiders heavy, maybe um, Rams heavy. But my last pick, I'm going with Cam Akers. He had two touchdowns. Uh, um, what last week? You know, what I'm saying. Well, yesterday, my bad. So on Thursday, hopefully, he'll you know kind of you know, uh, improve upon that or, or have the same type of game. His season arc has been wild. You know what I mean? Like, were they going to trade him? Were they going to cut him? And now he's arguably back to being their best offensive pl- weapon. Obviously, Cooper Cup's out, but like, yeah, crazy. Um, and, and good good for Cam Akers for, for what he's been able to do there. So, okay, Team B Marsh, Josh Jacobs, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Cam Akers, and, uh, and Team Michael, Devontae Adams, Alvin Kamara, Chris Olave, and Taysom Hill. We will see what happens next week. Bimar, you're going to be in studio next week, right? Yes, sir. Right. I love Wait. it. I love it. But how about the Broncos <laughs> flexing out Patrick Mahomes? Man, that tells you how bad the Broncos have been. <laughs> like, We're going to have to take Patrick Mahomes off of prime right. time because the Broncos have been so bad that we don't want them. So terrible. And so I, terrible. hopefully it's not a blowout. Terrible. We'll see what happens, and we will be back with you next week right here on CBS News Colorado and, of course, wherever you get your podcast. That's going to do it for our entire crew here at CBS, for, for our producer extraordinaire, Kevin Harper, for my partner, Brandon Marshall, and all of us here on Upon Further Review. I'm Michael Spencer. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Enjoy the rest of your week. We will talk to you next week.
Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. It's also the fastest growing fantasy app in the industry. 